uh, for today, Lori Friedman. Lori Friedman's dissertation is about the experience of prospective foster parents as they move through the licensing process. She shares her perspective on critical need for foster parents focusing on the mixed message they receive in terms as their role as paraprofessionals and caregivers. In addition to her professional work with children, Dr. Friedman and her partner are former, former, formerly licensed foster parents. Please welcome Dr. Friedman. for inviting me here today. I'm really, really excited to talk about foster care. It's been an integral part of my personal and professional life the past 20 years. And as was mentioned, I have done this, I've worked with children and families as a social worker for um, a number of years. Um, my husband and I were prospective foster parents and um, I did my dissertation and research on uh, recruitment of foster parents. That's really where I come from today from three different perspectives. Um, I often think that our life and in my life is really shaped by the people we meet along the way and experiences we have, and our, our lives go in directions we don't always plan. Just last Thursday, I was sitting in my office, and I had two uh, rising seniors come to me. It was kind of, I wasn't expecting it, but um, what should I do this summer, Lori? I know I'm graduating. I have one more year left. How do I prepare myself um, for life after graduation? I know I want to make a difference in the world. And... I wish I could say to them, if you do X, this is what's going to happen. Um, but I can give advice in terms of, you know, positioning ourselves to have opportunities and being open to where life presents us. So I wanted to just share that I think to show who I am and where I come from, three different experiences that lead me here or bring me here today. So the first is um, I, was, uh, I went to the University of Notre Dame for undergrad. I graduated a year early. Had enrolled in a master's program and realized very quickly I wasn't ready for this. So before classes even started, I took a job at a wilderness camp. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, so lived in the middle of the Everglades in the woods with delinquent teenage boys. Um, and so instead of being incarcerated, these youth were sent to live with us and we had a, a really just focus on group therapy, choice theory, and we worked with them um, in a group setting in the woods. And so you have these tough kids, and just imagine from Fort Myers, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, often getting involved, they've been arrested, they've been incarcerated, and we're in the woods. And when there's a snake under the bed, they're not as tough. And you really get to know them, and you get to know yourself, because it's a 24 hour a day job, right? We're living with them, and we're going on canoe trips, and we're washing dishes, and we know working with adolescents, if we're not making eye contact, those, those conversations happen, right? Um, and it breaks down barriers. So I really got to know them, and there was this 14 year old DJ, I'm 21 years old, and we get to know each other, and the kids go home, um, you know, every uh, about six months into it. Then they were able to eligible for home visits, and his home visits weren't very exciting. It turns out, DJs in foster care, um, a lot of things going on at the house. And one day he says, "Lori, will you adopt me?" And I'm 21 years old. I'm like, oh my goodness, and it just breaks my heart. And you know, this tough kid, almost in tears, and um, it was something that stuck with me. And so my two years at this job told me two things. One, the centrality of family and relationships in children's lives and their, and their resilience. And the second one was, I needed an MSW if I was going to continue in this field. That became very clear, and now I was ready. So I went to Penn, and um, I think my second experience there, I'm definitely wearing a number, but my first semester of graduate school, uh, Dr. Anthony Bruno, wonderful professor, writes on one of my papers, when are you going to get your PhD? And I'm like, huh? Like, never had, wasn't in my realm of thinking, and it just stuck with me. And I thought, how, what would I ever study in this much depth? Um, and to someone that I really respected had that much confidence in the work that I could do. So that was like, the second thing that really, I think, helped to shape who I am. And then the third was, well, fast forward to 2009. I've been working with children and families. I've been doing therapy. Um, I've done administration of group homes, often for foster children. I've been working closely with the court system, the child welfare system. Uh, largely in Camden County, New Jersey, Camden City. And my husband and I are ready to, join, to form a family. And I wanted to adopt a foster care. I'm thinking back to DJ as a parent and someone who now had over a decade of experience in social services. I knew the acronyms, I knew the lingo. It was the most convoluted process ever. Um, and it was so frustrating. And I'm happy to share more. I know there's a question and answer period later on. Um, but I'll just like to say that 
for some reason, and I actually was practicing with my husband earlier, and he started laughing when I said this. I don't know why, but I applied to doctor programs and why we're going through the foster to adopt process. And he literally just started laughing, like, why are we doing this? But I just was, had been disillusioned with the nonprofits and thinking research. I've got to do some research and I'll make a difference. So we were going to adopt a family of four. There were four siblings that were in uh, three different foster homes. They were half siblings, so we were going to grow our family and be done that way. And life happens. I became pregnant unexpectedly. Um, one of the foster fam uh, parents with her, two of the children filed a lawsuit because they didn't think that we should adopt their children. Um, not because of us, because they wanted to adopt, adopt the children and felt that the two children were closer to their biological children than the children with half siblings they hadn't lived with. Um, so all this happens and um, I end up at Bryn Mawr and their PhD program with a one month old. So, um, that's life. And then here we are now, and um, we actually just finished, um, after a 10-month process, we are now licensed foster parents again. And again, I will tell you, here we are, eight years later, still incredibly, incredibly frustrating. Um, and I can speak to the ins and outs if folks are interested. But um, So I come and I talk, it's, uh, I think it's really interesting to think of myself as someone who's a licensed clinical social worker, has administrative experience, has done research, and I'll talk about that. Um, in terms of how people experience the foster parent licensing process, and then has worked directly with children and families. So um, I bring that all today. Um, I did want to say that um, my research and my work focuses on non kinship foster parents. Um, so that being said, recognizing that A, obviously, I don't want any child removed from their home, and so I, I you know, choosing to not have any experience of abuse and neglect. But secondly, we know children, if they have to be removed from their homes, do better with a biological family member in a kinship home. So that's a given. Um, that being said, there's a critical need for foster parents, uh, non-kinship foster parents. So um, I want to situate this in a larger context of the child welfare system. I'll talk a little bit about racial disproportionality. Um, and what it means to care for others. I think it's interesting and it's difficult for me to separate foster care from parenting. And so now I have almost eight years under my belt of um, raising my daughter, um, which is just one of the, um, I think for me, the, the most privileged things I've ever done as a human being. But the children I care for in residential homes, and they can't be separated. And I think how we care for children um, in our society. So the other DJs, I mentioned that youth back from uh, Clewiston, Florida. So just to put it into perspective, there are 442,995 children who experienced a child a foster care, care placement in 2017. 45% of those children were in non-kinship homes. So again, there's been this movement over the past decade to really uh, look for kinship when possible. They have family fact-finding teams that really go out of their way. Their mission and their job is to find biological family members despite that 45% of children in our child welfare system are in a non-kinship home. Um, in terms of disproportionality, 2% of youth in foster care identify as Native American, uh, just under 1% identify as Asian, 22% uh, identify as African American, and other 22% identify as Hispanic, 44% uh, identify as white, and 8% identify as two or more other, or two more races. In Philadelphia, we'll bring it down a little bit, in 2017, there were 8,112 uh, individuals who experienced uh, foster care placement. So it's about 2% of children in Philadelphia who are in foster care um, in one year, right? And so looking at that, there might be children who um, were in foster care for a year and not the next year. Um, in Philadelphia, that disproportionately continues. And so we have 69% uh, of children in foster care are African American in Philadelphia, and 13.8% are Hispanic, and 126 are white. Now, Philadelphia actually does better than the national average in terms of kinship families. So around 40% of these children are placed in a kinship home, and just over 30%, 36% are placed um, in a non-kinship home. So that's a little bit um, different than national average. Um, so that's who's in foster care. And when we look at this disproportionality, again, looking at foster care, it's just a microcosm. We're all in the same society. So to be involved in the child welfare system, there's a number of steps that need to happen. Someone needs to report of a suspicion of abuse and neglect. We know that children of color are more likely than their families to be reported. 
um, as possibly being abused and neglected. And this is the same as our criminal justice system, right? We know that families of color are more likely to be reported, drug use, etc. Step two is the person who receives that call needs to screen it in. Is this worthy of an investigation? So that's step two. Again, families of color are more likely to be investigated. Step three, that investigation needs to come up with a substantiation. Yes, there is abuse and neglect in this home. Again, families of color are more likely to um, be substantiated. These are uh, allegations of abuse and neglect. And then step four is there needs to be uh, a reason to remove them. And again, that disproportionality continues there. So there's been some movement. Um, there's a mandated uh, reporter training. So anyone who works with children takes a three-hour training in the state of Pennsylvania. And there's a lot more work being done in terms of implicit bias and looking at the, con the, the conscious and unconscious messages we have when we make these decisions. But also we know that we make better decisions when people who are diverse and, and we're not making them alone. So that in these process that I just um, described, having it made by, it's not just one individual, but them and their supervisor, a group team, case consultation. So there's been some work in that sense um, to look at that. But again, families that are poor are more likely to have experiences of abuse and neglect. And so looking again, we know that families of color are more likely to live in poverty. So we can't separate this from what's going on in larger society. Um, so that being said, the need for foster parents. There are not enough foster parents. There are children who sleep in the offices of DHS because there's no placement for them. And this isn't just a problem in the United States and in Philadelphia. This is a problem globally, where there's just not enough people who are willing to open up their homes. Um, and so what happens when you don't have a shortage of foster parents? Children are placed in homes that aren't appropriate for them. And I don't mean unsafe, but when someone becomes a foster parent, they list, I want a child between this age, this gender, um, here are my interests. You know, we are avid, I don't know, um, outdoor enthusiasts. Like, here's what our family does. And if you have a child who's placed in your home who's not a good fit, age-wise, medical needs, it's more likely to be a disruptive placement, where the foster family says, this isn't working out, I'm going to give 30 days notice, they need to go somewhere else. So then the children are more likely to experience uh, multiple placements. The other thing that happens is that foster parents burn out. People who really want to do this, and they said, I can take one child. And then they get the phone call, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and the caseworker is begging them, can you please take one more child? They have nowhere to sleep tonight. Well, they say yes, and they burn out, right? So it affects the foster parents, and it affects the children. And so um, every time a child is removed from the home, that's a loss. Right? And, and so it affects their ability to form healthy attachments, which we know is central to child development and healthy child development. They've already been removed from their biological families. Every time they're removed from a foster home, that's a new home, a new bedroom, a new, new food, a new structure, a new neighborhood, a new community, possibly a new school, even though there are laws in place to keep children at their own school. But that's a loss. And so in 2018, just over a third of children in foster care who were in foster care between one and two years experienced three or more placements. So when I talk about the critical need for foster parents, we're looking to reduce the number of placements um, that children have. The positive side is that having a foster family in a stable placement really buffers the effects of abuse and neglect and helps the children to form healthy attachments with their caregivers. And so there are a lot of opportunities here as well. So why do people foster? Um, I'm going to guess that we have heard people foster for the money. So I'm going to ask you to put that aside. We'll come back to them and we have questions later on. But what the research shows, and this isn't just my research, is that people foster because of altruistic reasons. They feel like they're good parents. Their children have done well and moved out of the home. They have space. They want to give back. Um, they think it's going to benefit their biological children. It's a calling. Um, and so really they're looking at this. They feel like who they are as parents is central to who they are. And when you listen to people, the people that I interviewed, uh, when they went to that first orientation session, that was really exciting for them. They were looking to grow their family. They had been thinking about foster care for years. This wasn't just an instantaneous decision. It was like, I feel ready now. I've been thinking about it. Um, I feel called to it. Um, and I just want to say uh, a couple, share a couple of quotes that people I interviewed shared with me. Um, at the end of the day, as much as I want to be a mother again, and as much as I want a permanent situation, what I want and what I think any parent wants is for their kids to have what's best for them. 
and always. What's best is that you go back to your biological parent, and I'm just a stepping stone, you know, to help at that point. And someone else said, I know mothering. I don't even know if that's a word, but it never goes away. Once you're a mother, you're always a mother. And so this idea, it comes through a lot, and that when I talk to people and in the literature, that being a parent is central to who they are in loving children, and that's why they want to foster. So why do people stop fostering? Or, um, and so I, I say either stop fostering, or they start the licensing process and then don't finish it out. Uh, privacy. Being a foster parent, you have to let go of a lot of privacy. And so I will say in the past, and there's three, I should back up and say there's to be a foster parent, there's three, three steps. The first is you go to an orientation session. The second is you go to pre-service training, and you're required to have 20 hours of tra initial training to be a foster parent. And the third step is a home study. There's tons of paperwork. You have to show you're financially stable. You have to show that your home is safe. Uh, you have to have a bed for the child, it has to have space, etc. Um, and the, the loss of privacy, you have to give them your W-2 forms, you have to do a family budget and show them that you're financially stable. You have to do an autobiography. What are your relationships with your siblings, your parents? How often do you see them? Why don't you see them more often? What holidays do you celebrate? Um, I think it was probably 15 or 20 pages of questions that we just answered this last go around. And in the past 10 months, we have not had a child in our home yet. We have four different strangers in our house. Um, and so I bet there are people who don't want to do that. And I had someone say, you know, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I think one of the drawbacks about being a foster parent is the government in your life too much telling you how to raise a child. We think that parenting is this largely private task that we do in our own homes. And now with foster care, you're out in the open. You have a stranger telling you what you're doing is okay. Um, someone else said to me after their training, uh, we went over like a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. It seemed a lot like just sitting there for six hours listening to nothing but what you can't do actually. They say everything's normal, but there's a lot of things in place that make it seemingly harder to make things, you know, normal for the child. So again, these parents, these individuals who want to parent children, who are receiving these messages that, that go against the screen of, are you a good parent? Can you do this? Can you do that? Um, another reason people don't want to foster, they're scared, right? That the, the separation of, you can attach to this child, I'm going to have to say goodbye to. And that's going to be really hard for me. And if I have biological children in the home, how are they going to react to that? And so that fear of separation and loss is also something that gives people hesitation. And then behaviors. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to sugarcoat, but children who abuse and neglected have a higher level of uh, needs of care. And people are often afraid of what do these behaviors look like. And it came up in my interviews, people, when we hear about foster care, it's often from mass media, from pop culture, and um, it's not always pretty. And that's not the majority of the kids in this system. But if we haven't met them, I can see how we would be scared of some of these um, behaviors. So people often are hesitant to do foster care because of that. Um, and the other piece of it is that 40% of people who stopped fostering did so because they didn't feel supported by the agencies. They didn't feel the training was sufficient. They didn't feel like they had the support and the skills um, to, to deal with the children in their home, and so they stopped fostering. Uh, and likewise, they feel people are more likely to continue fostering when they feel supported by the agencies that they're working with. Um, the last piece of it is oftentimes people are interested in fostering and they just don't know where to find information. Or they think that they need to be, um, that they don't meet the requirements that there's a certain age limit, and there's not. The minimum age is 21, but you can be any age up over 21 to foster. They think they need to be heterosexual or married. They don't. Um, but that there's this mis miscommunication out there with that. Um, and then they often have unrealistic expectations of what it means to be a foster. So that's kind of going through there. So given my experience, given what I just shared, what I did was um, I interviewed people. I went to all of the orientation sessions, probably I'm taking about 15 over the course of a year. And after the orientation sessions, I invited people to come speak with me for an interview for an hour long about their motivations for being a foster parent, what they thought about the orientation session, what fostering meant to them. And then I did a follow-up interview with them, and I, I called them on the phone after their training sessions to see how their training sessions impacted them. Were they planning to continue to foster, were they not? What I did not do, just time constraints, 
is the third process. I did not follow up with them after the home study piece, right? So I got the first two pieces of it. And it was really illuminating. I also went through the agencies, um, all the materials they give prospective parents, and it was really interesting doing it from the role of a researcher now and not as someone going through the process. And so what I'd like to suggest, coming, you know, bringing this all together, is that raising children is hard work. It takes money and it takes support. And so we can bring that back. People do this for the money. We can, we can talk about that. Um, although the literature does not support that. But, um, but saying that doesn't mean that we don't care about children. That it's, it's part of the reality is that children take time, money, and support. And that, as I said earlier, the barriers to foster care, I think, are really a microcosm of our larger society and barriers to raising children this, these days. We can talk about affordable child care, quality child care, the hours of school, the hours of work, flexible work policies, the fact that increasingly we have um, in families two parents working to make the same amount of money that people made 20, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and foster care just exacerbates these issues because these children have higher levels of needs. And so people initiate the foster care process, licensing process because they believe they're good parents. They want to give back. They have experience raising children, working with children. I met teachers, um, I met daycare providers who were interested in becoming foster parents. But as they go through the process, um, and they intend to, to parent these children and to integrate them into their home, they're met with barriers. Um, the first one is that some of the messages they receive, and I talked a little bit about this earlier, um, they reduce their self-perception. They start questioning, am I really a good parent? I thought I was, but now I'm watching this video going, can I do this? Can I take care of this child? And I thought I knew what I was doing, but now they're telling me you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. So now I have no idea what I would do, because my kids are good, and they turned out well, so now I can't do all of this. And the second is, what is my role? Uh, and they get these mixed messages, and people um, have a hard time dealing with that uh, as they learn more about the procedures and the regulations of the system. Uh, so as they progress through the, the licensing process, these systemic factors, transportation requirements, discipline procedures, child care restrictions, uh, they really interact with them and they say, I can't really parent this child, given all of these constraints. Um, and that different people have different conceptions and expectations of parenting, right? There's not one way to parent. Um, I can't give someone a manual and say, here's what you should do. I can give suggestions, best practices, um, but it's largely different. Right? We have different, uh, different cultures, different approaches to it. So we interpret these messages differently. We all have different uh, economic factors. We have different cultural factors. And we interpret these, and these serve as barriers and detriments to becoming a foster parent. Um, and so that's really what I, what I found in my research. And I wasn't expecting to find one thing was role confusion. And I just wanted to share some of this, because I think it's really important when we think about why people foster and the roles that we have as parents. And some of the information that the agency presented, um, actually a lot of it, speaks of foster parenting as a job. Um, and so we look at this, uh, and I'll just you know, give you some of the information. Um, one of the goals of the pre-service training, and I quote here, is to be relevant and applicable to resource parents' job tasks and either lead to a certification process or an other means of recognizing the professional role of resource parents. And people use resource parents and foster parents interchangeably. Um, in several spaces, the, the, the foster parent was described as follows. You have three main roles. One in relationship to the child in your home, one in relationship to the child's family and community, and one in relationship to the agency's workers involved with their child. And this is followed by a list of tasks of what you have to do. If you are a foster parent, you are responsible for transporting that child to any medical appointments. And they are going to probably have mental health therapy, they're going to have doctor's appointments, they're going to have visitation with their biological families. You're also responsible for transferring them to school. So legally, um, the schools have to, the school district has to provide transportation so that child does not have to switch schools. That can take up to 30 days. In the meantime, the foster parent is responsible for transferring that child to school, which means that you could be living in South Philadelphia and this child could be going to school in Northeast Philadelphia. So let's think about that for a second. They could have visitation with their biological family in the middle of the week. It can happen more than once a week because the younger the child, the more likely or the more often they're required to meet with their biological families. Right? In addition to we all have lives and what, what we're doing. So that's they, they list all of that. Um, once you have your initial 20 hours of training, you have to do six more hours of training every year. Uh, in addition to that three hours of mandated abuse training. 
Um, as you go through it, you have to complete, and the word is a contract with the agency that details your responsibilities. You have annual evaluations, and they describe these as, quote, job performance evaluations are a necessary and integral part of most jobs, including the position of resource parent. Resource parent evaluations provide a time when you and your agency worker can review your work with your foster children. During the past year, highlighting the strengths you have demonstrated as well as areas where improvement may be needed. It's also a time to review the home and safety requirements to ensure your compliance with state regulations. If there are any serious areas of concern, this will be reflected on the evaluations and you may receive a plan of correction. And if you stop fostering, you have to submit a letter of resignation. So I look at this language, and I look at this confusion, and so A, now I'm taking my personal, uh, what I think is something, I think a lot of it's something personal, how do we raise children, and now I'm being evaluated on that every year. Um, and this private task is now out here in the public, but you're not treated as an employee, right? You're not often given information on these children. You don't have any say um, in, their, in, their, in what, what happens in their daily life. That's controlled by the caseworker, by the state, and the biological family still has a lot of, uh, a lot of autonomy as well. And so this serves as a barrier for a lot of people. There's a lot of confusion. So let's come back to people do this for the money. And I'd like to suggest that we just relook at this as a society and be really clear as to what it means to be a resource parent. So I mentioned all the responsibilities we have. If you have a child in your home right now in Philadelphia who doesn't have um, higher, high medical needs because then you get paid more, you receive $26 a day as a foster parent, which comes out to about $780 a month and $9,360 a year to care for a, uh, a child. Now, I recognize you can have more than one child in your home. Legally, you can have up to six child is the, is the legal threshold for foster care. So that's still less than $60,000 a year. Uh, for all these responsibilities. But for one child, it's less than $2 an hour that that resource parent is being reimbursed, if we think of it as a job. And if someone were to say, I think we need more money, I think a lot of times, this is our society, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, questions, do you care about that child? And we, let's look at how much child care workers are paid, preschool teachers, social workers, people who are in these caring professions. I don't know about you, but the cost of child care. Um, in Philadelphia, high quality child care is, high, is hard to find. Philadelphia in the suburbs here. Um, it's like, I think after, as of a couple of years ago, um, less than a, less than 33% of families had access to high quality child care. And that's defined by uh, Pennsylvania uses Keystone Stars. Infant child care, $1,500 a month. After school care. Um, depends on what you know, how many children it gets better, but we're looking at you know six, seven hundred dollars a month for after school care. The other piece of it is waiting lists to get into high quality child care or a lot of child care. They, we were on a wait list for two years for our daughter um, in, in Philadelphia. This was, this was eight years ago. But I talked to family and friends, and these wait lists are, are really hard. Well, how do you do this, and how do you navigate it when you don't know how many kids you're going to have in your home? how old they're going to be, and how long they're going to stay with you. That really complicates the child care factor. Jobs. I'm like, oh, I'm eligible for time off of work if I adopt, not for foster care. So there's no adjustment period there. Um, and we know it takes a while to adjust. And you're getting these phone calls. I might get a phone call at 9 p.m. Can you bring a child to your house at 10 in an hour? Because they need a place to just remove them from their home. So how do we navigate this world of child welfare uh, or child, uh, child care? Uh, and again, I think it's hard. Let's put foster care to the side. I mean, there's so many studies being done. It is harder to raise kids this day, these days. The cost of it in navigating work schedules, school schedules, um, and child care, and now we're going to exacerbate it with foster care. Um, and so I just want to say, if you put this all together, the critical need of foster parents, the role that they play in these children's lives, and it's actually really rewarding for a lot of people. And I'd like to suggest that the process I described to you could look a lot different based on what we know in the literature, based on what my experience, based on what I found in my, little, in my, my smaller study in the grand scheme of things. But imagine going to an info section and instead of having this video of, of this child being abused, and these are tear-jerking videos they play. I mean, I watched this video 20 times and it's still, it's tear-jerking. And the child is being removed. You see the dad not, you know, hitting the child. The mom and dad arguing. And you see the child waiting for their visit from the biological, you know, the parents, and they don't show up. And how does the foster parent handle this? 
Um, and so you talk to child welfare workers, and what they say is, we don't want someone to start fostering and not really know what's going on, and then quit. So we're going to give them all the negative, and we're going to you know, bring them there in the beginning. But what if, at an orientation session, you had someone come to you and go, I've been a foster parent, and here's the joys of the relationship. And I got to know the biological family, and look, she was a support for me, and I was a support for her. And we, we worked together and talked about the kids and what was best for the kids. And look at my daughter, my biological daughter. She learned a lot about herself and how to share her toys and her space. And we had conversations about inequality in society. And we talked about um, what it means to care for each other and to share your space. So imagine what that might look different. And if you had a part of this training was, here's your support team as a foster parent. We have this whole team at the agency, and here's how to use, utilize your caseworker. And here's who's going to be available for you when you don't want to do with a child. And here's who you can call. Um, and it's going to be stable, because that's the other piece. The turnover in child welfare is extreme. It's, a, it's enormous, because these workers are paid $25,000, $30,000 a year. Uh, and I can tell you from my work at Temple, the ones who are um, more committed, um, with, the, the very few caseworkers stay in that job who have the potential to do more. And, and I don't mean it to be judgmental, but they come and they're getting their MSW because they're in my classes and they're becoming supervisors and they're saying, I can't live on $30,000 a year. So you have, again, turnover and caseworkers. But how do you have a relationship with your caseworker? I think that might look really different to people who are thinking about this. And if you said at the orientation session, maybe you're not ready to open up your home yet for a foster child, but how about respite care? Because sometimes our foster parents need a break, and maybe you can take a child for a weekend. Or maybe you're not ready for that either, but maybe you can hold a collection drive, and you can talk about um, the need for car seats and clothes, because you get that phone call at 10, and these children are often from the garbage bag. And maybe the importance of a suitcase so a child feels more of a, a sense of belonging and who they are. And maybe in that orientation session, instead of saying this video of abuse and neglect, we're educating people about their neighborhoods and saying, here's how many kids in your neighborhood needed a place to stay last night. Right? And, and making those connections. I think those are really, really important. And then the trainings. Um, it's really interesting. So all these trainings are required. I know many of us have trainings for work that we go to. And it's nice when we go somewhere and we expect to be there four hours and we're done early. And like, okay, we have this extra time. Can I just tell you, having gone through the foster care process again this past year, I went to a four-hour training that was done in two hours. The second four-hour training, not only was it done in three hours, the other four-hour training was incorporated into it. So that's eight hours of training in three hours. It's crazy to me. There's a reason that the state is asking for these trainings. And there's a the literature seeing people want to foster when the children come in their home. They don't have the requisite skills. We have to take this training seriously. I'm a little biased. I coordinate our online program at Temple. Um, I have learned the value of technology and online teaching. Not that it doesn't replace face-to-face -face contact. I've had people tell me in, our, in my interviews, they got to make this training 20th century. Does everything need to be in person? Um, and what's the quality of it? Because then there was a training. We, could, we had to do five additional hours. I kid you not, it was literally, they printed out like from the Child Welfare get Gateway, 10 pages of notes that we read, and it was question and answer verbatim. There was no critical thinking involved, no scenarios. And we know people, adults learn better when we apply it to a situation. So no wonder these parents are then joining foster care and not knowing what their roles are. They're not knowing how to handle these behaviors. The person that they started working with isn't the person they're working with now. Um, and people opt out and go, I'm losing privacy, I'm losing time, bless you. And how do we do this? Um, and so I think all this comes together and it's really an opportunity to be strength-based in our, in our communication with potential foster parents and talk about the benefits of it, um, the differences that we make in children's lives and the support that we have. Um, and I think that's just the beginning. I think we have to look at these larger societal issues because when people say, who, who can be a foster parent? Um, I can tell you, we had our meeting two weeks ago. We're finally licensed. We've done all this work. And it was very complicated. But the caseworker comes to our house, and she sits there and says, so what, what kind of children, who are you willing to accept in your home? And I'm going through. She's like, well, will you accept someone who, what, what's their bet? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. How about someone, um, a, what did she say, a child who, you know, might have, you know, issues with incontinence? That's fine. Someone who yells a lot. That's fine. And so we're going through, and I'm like, I really don't have any concerns with behavior. 
I, I think the one behavior I was really concerned, we have two dogs, there are children who have a history of animal abuse. So if we know that, I, I prefer not to have that in our house. Okay. And I said, you know, age-wise, for the first time, my daughter's going to be eight. We wanted someone within two years of her age because we wanted her to be the older one. We have toys, appropriate activities, thinking through that. And I looked at her and I said, I'm not concerned about the behaviors. I'm concerned about the scheduling. How am I going to continue to work a full-time job? Because we can't afford, personally, for myself or my husband to not work full-time. And I have a very flexible job in a place at Temple, which largely supports me doing this. Unless I have class, I can really come and go. I said, it's the administrative requirements. All these, re these responsibilities I have, how am I going to do this? How am I going to transport this child everywhere? Um, and she looked at me and goes, yeah, I don't have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. And so, let's think, so we'll see what happens. We're starting with respite care, because I really felt like it was something I wanted to do personally. Um, but I think that these larger issues are compounded with foster care. So hopefully that helps to kind of set the stage. I think there's a discussion afterwards. Um, but there is a critical need for foster parents. These children are absolutely amazing and resilient. Um, and having more foster parents actually increases the chances and the likelihood of us having a placement with someone who matches our needs, our interests, the ages. Um, it's okay to say no. And it's better, it's better for the children as well who are less likely to experience multiple placements. So thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate it.